It's the day before the Real Art Roadshow auction, which is tomorrow night, Tuesday, the 1st of November, of course, at 6.30 p.m. here at uh, Art and Object. In just a second, Ben, myself and Lee are going to talk about some of the incredible works in this wonderful collection. It's a really important collection for us because we've been involved with it really since the beginning. Some of the works in this collection were acquired in our very first auction in 2007. And it's a collection that uh, we really urge you to come down and see. Bring your children. This is a collection that children love. We had a wonderful series of talks over the weekend. Hamish Keith and, of course, the founder of the collection, Fiona Campbell, spoke very eloquently here in the gallery on Saturday. We have another two days of viewing today, of course, and tomorrow before the auction. Seldom has the exhibition space at Art and Object been so alive with colour and vitality and vibrancy. It's a wonderful show and uh, we implore you to come down and check it out because there's a real joy and uh, happiness to this exhibition which uh, is sometimes lacking in New Zealand art. Uh, some critic, I can't remember who it was, might have been uh, Gregory O'Brien or David Eagleton said, you know, much of New Zealand art is defined by darkness, by blackness. You don't see that here. What you get in the Real Art Roadshow, I think, is a, a wonderful array of uh, uplifting colour. I think at the at the core of the, uh, the Real Art Roadshow is this wonderful little mini retrospective of five works by Pat Hanley. They're showing behind me. And across the five works, I think we strike at the heart of really what was at Pat Hanley's practice over a sort of a 50 or 60 year period. You have uh, the love and the joy and the ongoing sustained investigation of the female form and this wonderful torso painting down here. And then again, in this absolutely magnificent painting, uh, Lunar Lover, dominated by the, the female form with this unique sort of eye shape coming through in the, in the subject's head. For me, I think it is uh, probably one of the great Pat Hanley paintings. And then from there, of course, you've got Hanley's interest in uh, environmental themes playing out in the top left-hand corner there. And then on the right, the very, very powerful painting here, which has its core in Hanley's beloved Mount Eden garden. Alongside the sort of the wonderful insight that the five paintings give us into some of Hanley's key subject matter, you also get a really nice feeling for Hanley's technical development as a painter and the magnificent array of ways that he applies paint to the surface. Hanley's uh, hibiscus painting from 1968 is the earliest of the five, and I think in many ways it is among the most interesting formally. You can see that the whole surface of the painting is a charged field full of life. It is, of course, from his energy series, and uh, you can see in a pontalist fashion the way the artist has used these, the wider field to apply, I think, almost with the reverse of the brush, these wonderful dots of energy. But then in the center, in the middle of the flower, you get this much stronger, almost action painting style of applying the paint. And from there, all the way through to the Lunar Lover, which I mentioned before, then, which I think is 1981, you see how Hanley's painterly style transforms itself into this kind of mature masterpiece where a painted surface, poured surface, drip surface colludes in this wonderful portrait of a very beautiful lady. One of the, the key aspects of this collection, of course, is that it is a collection that's been curated and assembled very much with the end user, the end viewer in mind, which of course is the children of New Zealand of which hundreds of thousands have viewed this collection over the last 10 years. So many of the works go to the heart of a child's experience. And so many of the images are designed to communicate to children or to garner their feedback about their experiences. And of course, one of the key experiences is, is their family experience. And this lovely work from 1975 by Nigel Brown is a classic scene. Kiwi father there in his black shirt, mum and the kids in the high chair there, enjoying a family breakfast. And there are so many other images. There's a lovely Kate Small. There's the Michael Smither of the Boys on the Beach. The Reuben Patterson there work there, the Glitter Works. So many of these works are specifically put together in this collection very sensitively to allow children to experience their own life journey. I'm standing here in front of one of the stars of the Real Art Road Show and a work that's very, very dear to our hearts here at Art and Object. This is Ricky Swallow's Blanket Shark from 1996. And Fiona Campbell tells us that this is one of the works that really captures the imagination of the children when they first come into the truck, the art gallery truck of the Real Art Roadshow. Now this is a work that we offered in our very first auction in May of 2007. And it's a work that really goes to the heart of the purpose of the Real Art Roadshow collection in broadening children's horizons as to exactly what art can be. And this is a work that is about, in fact, the artist's childhood. 
His parents, or his father, was a fisherman in Lorne, uh, down the coast from Melbourne. And this body of work, of which this is one, a number of blanket sharks, conflates his memories of the fear of the deep into the great unknown and hauling out a shark with happy family memories of huddling under a blanket in the boat with his family with a thermos of coffee and enjoying the ride home after a day out fishing with his parents. So it's a wonderfully subtle work that goes to both the heart of childhood memories and the instructional power of art and what Swallow has done which he does with so much of his work, we think of course of the tape recorders and the record players made from cardboard, is to take an object, in this case an animate object in the form of a shark, and put it through his process of transformation to come up with, would you believe, a cuddly blanket shark. When installing this collection, it was impossible not to think about all the little eyes that have been observing it over the past 10 years and to think about what their responses to some of these works might have been. Just last night, a young boy was in the gallery and expressed some consternation over the Bill Culbert here. Oh, Dad, you know, the classic response, look what he's done with those old bottles. And it got me thinking that there's quite a few things in this collection that appear on the surface to be relatively simple or straightforward, but that they're actually presented by artists who are extremely accomplished at what they're doing. And I guess Bill Colbert would be a great proponent of that, along with the likes of Gretchen Albrecht, Peter Robinson, Don Driver and Warwick Freeman. Warwick's wonderful bullseye of um, collected beaks and feet is terribly intriguing and hugely accomplished. I'm sure many, many hours have been spent inspecting that. Another painting for me, which is uh, among the most important works in the uh, Real Art Roadshow collection, is Ian Scott's Homage to Morris Louis from 1969. Ian Scott is an artist who I think has been fairly underrated on the secondary market in recent times, but we are starting to see that beginning to change. And this painting here presents a wonderful opportunity and a challenge for the New Zealand secondary art market, I think. It's a painting which I think the artist himself regarded as one of his most important works from the period, and I think it's one of the last ones of these left in private hands. Morris Louis, I think, was um, widely acknowledged as being, I think, Ian Scott's almost favourite artist, and of course he did a, a whole series dedicated to referencing and critiquing and extending Morris Louis' work, and you can see one of Morris Louis' classic stripe paintings playing out in the model's dress on the right hand side. But uh, unlike a lot of other Ian Scott's works, the portrait and the landscape combine, I think, in a wonderful fashion here. You can see her dancing over the top of a constructed west coast landscape. It's obviously not painted from life or on plain air. It's, a, it's very much a constructed landscape. You can tell from the far right there, you can see Mount Taranaki pouring out. And then on the left, I think, there's a dialogue with another artist, a, a local artist, Colin McCann. This form that comes up from the left here, very much redolent of uh, the near contemporaneous gate series. And uh, Annie and Scott and Colin McCann were very close for a number of years. On top of that, also, you have this, this waterfall coming down here through, through the centre of the picture plane. These wonderful West Coast uh, phallic-like cowrie trees. All in all, just a superb painting. Continuing on the blanket theme, this is Peter Robinson's Cosmo of 2004. I think one of the things that makes Peter Robinson such an interesting and challenging artist is the diversity of media and entry points that he takes into his subject matter. One of, I think, Robinson's great loves is the American artist, Philip Guston. And that work is a bit messy, a bit riotous. And what we see here is a collage, a collage of felt pieces that's very much a, a riot of allusions to body organs, body functions, and a kind of a phantasmagoria of internal process. Obviously, we read things such as this as eyes, intestines, and various other body parts. And it's all a bit sliding, and it's a bit shifty, and it's difficult to know exactly, A, what the subject matter is, and B, what the conceptual underpinning of a work such as this is. And I think that really goes to the heart of Robinson's practice in that he operates on numerous layers with multiple reference points. This is a work, of course, which is deeply appealing in a colourful sense to children and is a work that I think is one of the finest uh, in this collection.